Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at this wonderful occasion where we are welcoming the official South Africa book launch of the Systems Work of Social Change by Cynthia Reyna and Francois Bonici. You can also go to the website at www.thesystemswork.org. This launch is the second launch of this amazing book, which I hope all of you will read. And it is the South African, or shall I say, Global South launch. Uh, there has been a launch before. Um, and so we will be kicking off today with a few guests and especially uh, Dr. Precious Malloy Matsepe, who is the Chancellor and co-founder of Motsepe Foundation, the Chancellor of UCT. We also have Rose Molokwane, who is from Slum Dwellers International and Fed Up, and Renee Parker from Arabs. We will have the moderation done by Kinte Khadebe, and we also hope to hear from you questions in the chat function um, and we will moderate those as we go along. The, uh, the questions anyone who would like to ask would then also be able to win a book, one of the systems change books that we are giving away, which the Metsepa Foundation has funded. Uh, we also would like you to also just remember to please keep your cameras turned off and be muted and, um, and just use that Q&A function as you go along. I wanted to introduce the book before I hand over to Dr. Precious Motsepe, just to say that this book has been a long time in the making. There is a, a lot of work that has gone into it over the past five years, specifically starting with work at the Bertha Center and looking at how systems can affect the work that we do and how thinking about the way that systems interact and how we use levers within the system in order to bring about social change. So there are, are many people that have been involved in putting together the work, the research, but also uh, Cynthia and Francois have collated that and, and brought out some very helpful lessons for all of us. So I hope that you will enjoy the discussion and the introductions um, and will engage with us over the next hour or so. So thank you so much for joining us. I would like to hand over to Dr. Precious Maloy Matsepe, and, um, and that's it from me. Thank you, Solange Rosa and Catherine Dugan for the very warm welcome and for hosting today's event. The Better Center has played a truly important role in fostering social change and I know it will continue to do so. The important book being launched today is also intimately connected with the center, with many of the experiences and case studies on which it draws deriving from when Francois was founding director and Cynthia was a senior researcher here. Social entrepreneurs transform South Africa the book comes at a time when we are really at a fork in the road, globally and in South Africa. On the one hand, we have economies that are increasingly recognized to be failing. And I don't necessarily mean failing against matrix such as GDP, but failing to do what we really want and need them to do. And that is provide lives of freedom to everyone. At the same time, systems change has, has and it's currently occurring. In the book, there are many incredible examples of transformative enterprises and every practitioner who is trying to make a change 
and who is making a change gives us hope. When I first came across social entrepreneurship, I was reinvigorated by the idea that people could be the focus of businesses instead, instead of just profits. We've been taught about the triple bottom line of economics, economic, social, and env environmental value. But we were also taught, sometimes in a subtle way, that we ultimately need to compromise this triple focus in favor of profit and growth. I then came across the Clothing Bank, a social enterprise based in Cape Town with a purpose-driven mission to economically empower vulnerable women. It was the stories that the women shared with me that more than any of the social enterprise strategies or philosophies that really propelled my continued interest. I met a woman at the clothing bank who without ever earning a minimum wage in her life was now operating a successful business. She came from the neighboring area in the Western Cape in the slums and she told me about her brother who at that time was sick with cancer and that she was now able to support him with access to medical care that he would otherwise not have received if she did not get an opportunity to work at the clothing bank. And then I met Luvuyo Rani, a social entrepreneur without knowing what he was, that he was one. He founded Silulo Uluto Technologies as a single internet cafe that operated in Kailicha with the mission of enabling access to technology to people living in the township. He has since turned that single internet cafe into a franchise which operates in townships across South Africa. And it trains each new owner with digital skills that they take with them to share with others. In the book, Francois and Cynthia write about the Netherlands-based social enterprise, Bursoch. The enterprise in their daily processes ask themselves, how can we make ourselves redundant? This mindset of empowering others through business development or tech skills may come across as a simple gesture of humanity. But beneath this, this exchange of skills and knowledge is the redistribution of power and freedom. It is an incremental shift in our collective values that is bringing about significant shifts in our systems, making them more equitable, transparent, and inclusive. The importance of social entrepreneurship for most of us is looking back over the last century, I would say, we can think of something that could have inspired us and moved us as in a community that works together to provide food for those left jobless and moneyless. The overworked nurses, friends calling just to make sure that we are okay, pupils doing their best to keep learning whilst they were under severe stress. Most of us look back over, this, over the past 20 months and can think of something that dismayed us. Accounts of corruption in COVID services, in COVID, COVID service providers, differences in the ability of schools and universities to accommodate online learning, jobs that are lost by single mothers, young people in despair with little prospect of finding work, and the cynical exploitation of division via social media. The question of how we change the world quite simply and the question of how we unlock and support more and more of these good things we want and how we do our best to guard against and to eliminate the bad things that we are scared of. With the immense resources, energy and sincere efforts of people who are devoted to such change at our connected disposal, 
there is potential for us and those that we work with to do more. I think really putting people at the center of our efforts is the only way to move decisively forward. But it goes against very much the grain of the current development and philanthropic and business thinking. Evolution of social entrepreneurship as we know it. I can recall when I started to be exposed to the practice, that is when my husband and I established the Muzipa Foundation, where we already understood the dynamics of local communities. Communities across South Africa and in Africa have, for example, built strong bonds of trust with religious and traditional leaders. And these relationships stem from a long history of finding refuge in the church during hard times. These connections are a form of social capital and power. And they remind us that the system change begins and ends with people and their, and their existing multifaceted reality. We are not the experts. People living in communities are the experts. And I think that Francois and Cynthia use the insights in the book and from having interacted with people to give us timely and important advice, such as, we need to be humbler. We need to pay more attention to context. We need to be more patient. We need to trust people more. We need to put processes, not outcomes, at the center. The work of, of systems change requires us to be open to learning, to adjusting our own interpretations as we go along which means that we may need to be flexible. When we get it right, we unlock cooperation and momentum rather than opposition and frustration. Through the work of our foundation, we support social entrepreneurs by means of access to opportunities such as executive education programs at Harvard. At first, they may be confused because practitioners are so focused on what they, are, what they do best. And they are often afraid to take time off to reflect and to learn. But it is also very important that practitioners take a step back from time to time. Our actions can become instinctive and we need space to refine this instinct in order to truly grasp the power of the process. We see some of the social entrepreneurs coming out of this executive education program, sharper, more focused, more accommodating, and more ready to take things to the next level. Not because they have redeveloped their strategies, but because they have gained deeper insights into procedures that they are already doing, and also because they are in an environment where they can learn from the other social entrepreneurs. System change for me and the social entrepreneurs working in the system, whether they know it or not, are a very important discipline. Our operations occur across boundaries and silos, and we don't appreciate enough how radical this is. To, to cooperate across disciplines and to focus areas is to break down those systemic barriers that constrain our attainment of the sustainable development goals. The goals are cross-cutting, and if we want to make this vision a reality, we need to wear multiple hats and identify and deepen connections. This is why I want to thank everyone at the Becker Center for a decade of providing support in building this dynamic world that we want because we want togetherness. We want inclusiveness. 
and we want sustainable models of living and of being. So I wish to thank Francois and Cynthia again for bringing legitimacy to the unsung activists of our time. For me, the value of this book, which I strongly urge everyone to read, is ultimately that it provides a roadmap for new ways of thinking, of doing, new ways about system change, which makes it less scary. In doing so, it makes a vital contribution as the R Lab, an organization which is profiled in the book, and it makes hope contagious. Thank you for having me today at this very important event. And again, I wish to thank the authors of the book and all the practitioners of social entrepreneurship. And I believe truly that this is a discipline that will help South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, actually the whole continent, to achieve some of the sustainable development goals that we have set for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Precious Mutepe, for I think contextualizing the importance of this work. And I think also sharing some of the nuggets that Cynthia and Francois have just really put into this book, which is really amazing. I'm delighted to be joining you this afternoon to talk about this book. As mentioned earlier, my name is Ginzi Khatebe and I'll be moderating our conversation this afternoon. I'm really excited that in the next hour or 45 minutes, we'll be unpacking some of the real critical insights that Cynthia and Francois have collated in this book. I feel like this is such a critical time to be having these conversations. South Africa and the rest of the world is still reeling and responding to the pandemic, which upended a lot of the assumptions that we had about our world, how we've come to organize our systems, and the expectations that we all had about how quickly we could reorganize our lives, communities, and organizations during the pandemic. In South Africa currently, we're heading towards the run-up to our local elections in November. So I feel like I'm constantly being bombarded by these really important questions about how we can facilitate social change and create opportunities for alternative forms of self-organizing and mobilizing. These are big questions with no easy answers. And I think what keeps me hopeful is that the work that we do at the Bertha Center really sits at the nexus of these questions about how we can build socially just, transformed and equitable societies. At Bertha, we work across a variety of thematic areas and we're embedded and we have embedded a systems approach into our work because of the deep recognition that our current system and ways of working are not sufficient. Our reliance on centralization, linear decision-making, reactive policy design and asystemic thinking, for example, often means we're blind to the complex, interdependent, unpredictable and emergent ways in which our systems are organized. What really resonated for me when I was reading this book by Cynthia and Francois is how sometimes the language and terminology that we use as systems practitioners can actually be extra abstract and maybe even exclusionary. And for me, that resonated with me. So the framing of this book and how the authors emphasize how often the systems work that they speak about is ongoing, historical, and importantly, is about the process and less so the outcomes. To me, it felt like they were holding up a mirror to the work that we've been doing. When I look at the systems work that the Bertha Center has been involved in and the work that we champion, I see this as a running thread in our approach. We often think critically about what it means to work with empathy and humility. How do we center people in our work? How do we build connections and relationships? How do we ask difficult questions about power? And what does this mean for us who are doing this work when we're located in the global South? And this book really encapsulates trying to grapple with some of those questions. So I know that we're really excited to delve into this conversation and some of the rich questions that I know that you're already thinking about. I just wanted to quickly remind you that if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box because after we've had an opportunity to chat with both Cynthia and Francois, as well as our two guest speakers, we're actually gonna turn, the, turn to you and try to answer some of the questions that you'd like to share. So first and foremost, let me introduce Cynthia and Francois. Cynthia Rayner is a researcher, writer, and lecturer here at the Bertha Center. 
Her research focuses on how organizations and communities work to shape social systems in collective ways. Cynthia has been working in South Africa for the last decade, where she has served in several organizations, including Generation Ubuntu, Mothers to Mothers, and the Starfish Great Hearts Foundation. Dr. Francois Bonici is a public health physician, professor, social change practitioner, and foundation leader. His career is rooted in frontline medical and humanitarian practice and has evolved to advance social change work more broadly. He currently serves as director of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship and head of social innovation at the World Economic Forum. He was previously founding director of the Bertha Center. Francois and Cynthia, welcome. It's lovely to have you. Thanks so much. Francois, I'd like to, to start with you because in the book, both of you speak about how you came to a point where you were dissatisfied with the status quo and our current ways of working. And in the book, you highlight how you notice that even though you were working in the space for a number of years, you weren't really seeing any significant change. Francois, can you expand on the story by taking us through how you and Cynthia came to write this book? Thank you so much. And first of all, just to thank everyone, I think, who's here today, uh, both you and, and Dr. Precious says it's kind of starts and ends with people. So just to say that kind of the reason we, I guess, stuck, took this whole journey was because of the people and the community around the Bertha Center. So this launch feels really like bringing it home. Uh, it's the start of a, a number of different uh, academic university tours that we're having and we really thought it was important to, to, to bring and share the work back that we had learned from this, this community of, of people. So I see you know, on the call, uh, both Bertha Scholars, former staff uh, organizations, we worked with people there, uh, Lisa from the, who worked at the Bertha Foundation at the time, and of course, Dr. Precious, uh, and just amazing to have the chancellor of the university come and, and you know, personally bring her own opinions into the space. So it does all start with people. I guess that's why we, we, we wrote the book and, and who we learned from. Um, you spoke about the dissatisfaction. It wasn't only a dissatisfaction what we were seeing out there, it was also a dissatisfaction in our own careers and how we had failed at times. And, and I think the community that was created around the Bertha Center helped to surface what I think perhaps, you know, in the early days was a, a relatively naive approach to what we thought could happen in the center and models of social innovation and social entrepreneurship and social change. Uh, and what we learned from others in South Africa who've had a much longer history of working with communities. And so combining the, the, the experiences that we learned with the, I guess the new ideas around how social change was evolving, um, put us in a place of asking questions around how does this deeper transformative change happen? And as we, joined, I guess, a, a global conversation around system change, what we were hearing in the global north and what we were seeing of people taking like a complexity view and a systems thinking view of social change we found was quite disconnected to the realities on the ground. Um, and I think uh, that uh, led us to doing a, a range of different pieces of work from the executive education course that, that still runs at the Bertha Center um, can say that uh, that you've been heavily involved in on system change and social impact, uh, a, a fellowship program we ran with the Rockefeller Foundation, and then this uh, body of work, uh, case studies and research we had done together with the Schwab Foundation, where on our work, uh, which was in partnership with the Motsepe Foundation, called Beyond Organizational Scale, and we've kind of been kind of trapped in this mindset of let's just grow things that work. Uh, you know, here's a project that works, let's just scale it up and, and, and how there were clear limitations to all of that. Um, I know we don't have too much time, so I'm gonna hand over to Cynthia to share a little bit around kind of what that, you know, what that came to and what we learned and set a frame for the book. But just, it's really a, 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 a huge honor and I'm really delighted to, to be to, together in this community again. So thank you for having us. Should I go ahead, Kim? Say okay. Thank you so much, um, Francois, and thank you for the whole group that has put this together. I feel like the Bertha Center has been a true learning community for us, and really gathering people into a business school that wouldn't be there otherwise. And for us, that was a great learning opportunity to really understand work that was happening outside of the traditional social entrepreneurship environment looking at work that went into community organizing, into um, activism, and really start to bring that voice of social justice into the conversation about social entrepreneurship. 
Um, I'm going to share a few slides, but we're, we're really going to try and move quickly to the storytelling because I think that's where we really um, find that we learn the most. Um, but I'm just going to give us a framing so that we can have this conversation. Um, I, I don't think anyone on this call would, would not um, believe that the social challenges we face are complex and large scale. We really frame the book in the first chapters by, by, by unpacking these terms. What do we mean by complexity? What do we mean by scale? But it's really the issue of depth where we spent a lot of time in particular. We realized that the depth and the historicism of social issues means that we can't deploy just efficient solutions that scale. Um, in fact, that depth piece was really the driving factor for, for looking deeper at the work that we were seeing on the ground. And really another piece that we, we brought into the mix and we, we, we debated whether or not we would spend a lot of time on this, it felt kind of um, uh, extensive to, to put a whole chapter towards the history of social change. But the more we looked at it, the more we realized that a lot of the lingo that we were using, the jargon, the ways that we were approaching social change were rooted in this idea of an industrial approach. So particularly the language around scale, where we were thinking that replication of solutions that worked in one context to another context would um, allow us to achieve efficiencies in social change. We kind of looked at that critically and, and tried to figure out whether or not that was in fact true. And what we found was that we were, these industrial approaches, in, in fact, um, in some cases were not helpful, in other cases could be quite destructive. So we really spent a, a period of time looking at what, what, what does that industry mean for us and how can we look back at what we've been doing for the last 100, 200 years and mine the things that in fact do work um, rather than simply going ahead with these industrial approaches that, that might in fact not be getting us to where we want to go. Beyond this, um, I, I think what was surprising and, and exciting for us was that much of the work that we wanted to see and that we wanted to uncover was already happening very deeply within organizations. It wasn't often the work that was being celebrated at um, you know, big con convenings. It wasn't the work that was being highlighted in funding proposals and in the marketing of organizations. But in fact, it was very deeply rooted in so many of the organizations that we were able to study and spend um, extensive time with. And out of that, we saw that actually systems work is not so complicated. It's, it's in fact, it's about building systems that are responsive to the needs on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis and making sure that they are representative of the people who live in those systems. And the way that or we saw organizations doing this, first of all, fostering connection, we're, we're talking here about how people are the beginning and the end of change. Well, when people are staying together while learning, when they have a true collective identity and can drive change together, this is what really allows people to stay together through the, through the ups and the downs, through the change, and ensure that the change is responsive to the needs of those who live in them. Embracing of context, what does this mean? It means simply that people are able to adapt to the needs that they have on the ground, that we're not looking at cookie cutter solutions, we're not looking at one size fits all, but rather we're ensuring that problem solvers are at the grassroots and that they have the decision-making power in order to make changes on a day-to-day -day basis. And lastly, reconfiguration of power. This was truly exciting and, and spoke directly to that depth piece that we, we spoke about earlier. The reconfiguration of power is ensuring that that decision-making power is in perpetuity, that it is in policies, that it is in the day-to-day -day patterns of how we do things. Um, so we talk a lot about participatory policies. These are the policies that ensure that those systems can stay responsive and representative over time. I'm not going to go into the details of the practices because we don't have time here. We're gonna be talking about them in the stories, but just to show you that beneath these principles, which are kind of the values of systems work, we look at four different practices that we believe we could see in so many of the organizations that we had spent time with. And that in fact, we're taking those principles and putting them into, act, into action on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks. Thanks so much for that framing. Cynthia, I think it's so critical. And, and right now I wanna jump straight into the storytelling because I think that's when all of what you're speaking about really comes to light. And now I'd like to welcome Rose Molokwane and from Slum Dealers International and Renee Parker from R Labs, which are two organizations that are featured in this book. I'd like to start off with you, Rose, and just give you a brief introduction before we jump into the questions. 
Rose Molokwane is the national coordinator of the South African Federation of the Urban Poor, one of the founding federations affiliated to, Swam, to Slum Dwellers International, a global network of slum dweller federations in 33 countries across the global south. Rose is a veteran of the anti-apartheid struggle. She's one of the most internationally recognized grassroots activists involved in land tenure and housing issues. She was awarded the UN Habitat Scroll of Honor in 2005 for her struggle to bring land and homes to the poor. Rose, I want to maybe start briefly, if you could give us a broad overview of how Slum Dwellers International's work and how its approach to community organizing has assisted in the work that you do. Thank you very much, Kenze, for inviting me. When we started the organization, we never knew that we will be where we are today. We started knowing nothing. Then in 1991, the Catholic Church, through the Catholic Conference of the Bishops, requested one or two of the activists to establish a workshop where they invited leaders from different communities to come and talk about their lives. It was difficult to come up with an agenda that we thought will be relevant for us when we organize ourselves. But because we were sharing the platform with the Indians during that workshop, where the Indians were telling us that they have voted for their government for 40 years, waiting for honey and milk to flow on the street. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, what they got from their government was 800 people sharing one toilet. It was amazing to listen to that story, but it was also touching to want to know how does it happen? Because here in South Africa, we were getting everything for free. We had houses that we got from government. We got toilets, water, electricity. Although we were staying in informal settlements and slums, but we couldn't understand what the Indians were telling us until we had the first exchange program that made us to visit the Indians. And we were witnessing the hardship that the Indian women were facing whilst they are having their democratic government. Coming back to South Africa, we learned the system of savings. Then we said to ourselves, we should come up with our own agenda as South Africans. And the agenda that drove us was the agenda of land, housing and poverty eradication. Because we knew now that most of our people don't have land. Most of our people don't have houses. That's why we are staying in informal settlements and slums. And most of our people are poor and government is not taking care of the poverty of the people that are facing. The savings that was driven by women was a very important tool that made us to understand that we should mobilize and organize ourselves. What is it that we are going to do with the savings? We are going to use the savings as a leverage to attract more resources that will help us to address the issue of landlessness, homelessness, and poverty. Why do we come up with these issues? It's because on a daily basis, we are faced with these challenges. How do we achieve all these things? Then we came up with the issue of exchange programs exchange programs by visiting each other, learning from each other. Because we know that in our organization, most of the people are not educated. Some of us are semi-educated, semi-illiterate, but we know what we want and how we get it. That is why savings was so important for us, because even though we are unemployed, but we don't go to sleep without anything into our stomach. The little money that you are saving is the way of bringing us together, talking amongst each other, raising our, our voices to be heard by the formal world. The exchange program that made us to be more connected with other countries. We were so proud as South Africans that through the savings, 
through exchange programs, we were able to visit different countries like Zimbabwe, like Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, where we also teach each other the importance of savings. The culture of savings that brought us together, the culture of savings that made us to be able to engage with our government. I remember in 1994, when we met with the first minister of housing, the late Joe Slovo, where we showed him that we want to do this together with the government. And Joe Slovo told us, show me the model, then I will know how to support you. So what our model was to motivate, empower our women to come together through savings. Automatically, he pledged an amount of 10 million rent for us to build our own houses. That's where we came up with what we call Ujani Fund Agreement, where now the Department of Human Settlement agreed to work with us and give subsidies directly to us because we promised that we were going to build better and bigger houses than the RDP houses that our government is building for our people. We that have done that, but we said after building a house, then what? Hence, we came up with what we call fed up income generation program, where we are learning to our people who want to start their businesses, to those who have already started their businesses, but making them promoting their business to make sure that they get money from our organization to build better businesses for themselves and to also get the training amongst ourselves on how to build better business for themselves. As I speak with you, right now we are able to borrow some money to our different women who have started their businesses. An amount of 30,000 rent that we are giving out to our members who are building their businesses. And the businesses are flourishing. The system that we are using to give out the loans is the collective systems, because we know that we have to support each other. We are saying we want to see the lives of our poor being changed by themselves. We are the problem. We are the solution. We want to join hands with anyone who wants to support the initiatives and the activities that we have started with our own bare hands and our own limited resources that we are having. The other important thing that we have so, come up with... If I can jump in, and, and I don't want to interrupt you because I think what you're saying is so, so critical, especially this concept of being able to act locally but also engage internationally and I want to maybe bring Cynthia in here maybe to reflect a little bit on in the book you speak about exactly what Rose is talking about around how SDI acts as a platform which is a space for learning and collaboration where you can actually begin to start shifting the power dynamics and you call a lot of this work deep work Cynthia could you maybe briefly reflect on that and why it's important for organizations to engage in this work and what the lessons are for us Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Kinte. And thanks so much, Rose. I think that these sorts of um, activities that you're talking about, what we saw was that they were this um, platform that was actually um, happening at a transnational level, um, allowing organizations to go visit other organizations, to learn from each other, to really understand the work in the true context, but then be able to adapt the work when you came back to South Africa and other organizations learning from you as well. Um, we saw that that is um, a really deep practice um, that was allowing a platform to build across the world, which then in fact worked upwards because many of the uh, invitations that SDI has now entertained to places such as UN Habitat has allowed those policies to then filter up to the highest levels. So I thought that it's an extremely great example of how organizations can work locally, adapt policies, but then learn from each other across um, essentially a global platform. Thanks, Cynthia. I think those are such important aspects to highlight. And I want to shift gears a little bit and welcome Renee Parker, because I think it's so important to hear these stories as sort of Rosa started painting that picture for us. 
So Renee Park is the managing director of R Labs, and she's played a leading role in transforming R Labs into an award-winning global social enterprise from the humble beginnings of a community project here in Cape Town. R Labs is a global movement that has inspired replication of the model in 23 countries and has impacted more than 13 and a half million people since its inception. Renee, in the book, Cynthia and Francois point out how in the early days of R Labs, there was this really significant moment where as an organization, you recognized that you weren't just organizing at-risk youth from the Cape Flats in South Africa, but you were actually bringing, to, bringing together people who had similar lived experience and how you developed the sense of we as an identity and how that became crucial for the work that our labs does. Can you speak on the work that our labs, our labs does and the significance of being able to cultivate collectives? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. And Cynthia and Francis, the book was, was really enlightening. And as we had a discussion yesterday, you know, we, as our labs and many organizations, we do so much work. We, we, we've been doing this on the ground for many years and even people before us, but it never had a name or we didn't think of giving it a name or giving it terms and referencing it. And I think the book really brings light to that. And just for our labs, we started out in the... 2009, we officially registered, but before that, when we were busy working in the community, all we wanted to do was just really to change one person's world, right? And that's what it started out with. You know, you can look at someone and you can see whether they've lost hope or not. And just working in the community and seeing people and not just young people, but different generations, they have lost hope. You know, people are just feeling down and, and feeling like there's nothing else for them out there. And when we, we started, you know, we, we didn't have a name, we didn't have a grand plan. We just thought, okay, let's, let's start equipping people, um, you know, providing different skills. We use technology, we love technology, but we understand it's only a tool. It's, it can only be used as a tool and, and it enables various things. And in training and equipping individuals and understanding, like, they can provide solutions for their own problems. I don't think as any human beings, we need someone else to come and give us a solution. We have a solution. What we need is enablers around us. We need systems around us. You know, we need different people, partners, stakeholders. There are different players that need to come together that enables environments for people to provide and make up their own solutions. So for our labs, that's really been the basis. It's, you know, we, we, believe the most underutilized resource in the world is people. Okay. And so our mission is really to unlock, unlock potential in people and just working with, with young people. We've seen how they've grown um, just by firstly for them to understand I am worthy. I have the power to make my own decisions, but even for individuals to get to that place, Takes, takes a long time. And so as soon as we, we can fast track that, as soon as we can make more people get to that place in their lives, we realize that other people around them see that. And so even role models is one of the key things that, that we believe um, in our labs. And so if you see somebody in your community get out of poverty, make something of their lives, believing in themselves, changing their future, of course, you're going to feel you can do it yourself. And so bringing the, bringing the heroes to life that's actually on the ground is definitely also one of our, our big things. Sure. Thanks, Renee. Francois, I want to bring you into the conversation just to reflect a little bit on the work that our labs has done and their ability to sort of replicate this model in so many other contexts, because in, this, in the book, you speak about how important doing slow work is or going slow to go fast. Um, what does that mean and how important is it for organizations to grapple with doing that kind of deep work? I think it's a big temptation and what we've, uh, you know, in, in, certainly in the social entrepreneurship movement have tried, you know, spent 10, 15, 20 years encouraging people, okay, let's use this like business thinking, let's like scale quickly, let's, you know, be performance oriented, let's get outcomes. And, and while we need that because we need to solve challenges at scale, um, there's, you know, th there's been a downside to that kind of thinking. And so I think the book tries to kind of complement that with this deep work thinking. And I think, as Renee said, it's kind of been intuitive to many organizations to be to hesitate around some of the external 
pressures to to scale uh, or scale in particular kinds of ways. Uh, and I think what we what we identify, you know, particularly in the ways that that our labs works, uh, you know, and and in many of the things that they do is this sense of creating. Uh, the kind of co collective identity uh, and really, you know, they, they, they talk about it as providing hope. Uh, and obviously we try to unpack that and understand what's really going on and how do they do that day-to-day -day work um, and how important uh, it is to, to build um, these collectives from which so much can emerge. And so it's really thinking that, you know, that, that, that the scale over time and the lasting impact of what they do uh, is really captured in in their work. Um, I know time is relatively short, so I'll. Uh, I know there's some interesting questions coming in as well. So looking forward to engaging in this. Thanks, Francois. But I'd actually maybe like to to introduce um, Warren Nielsen. So he is a associate professor here at the Graduate School of Business. Um, he works within the social innovation space. He also serves as academic director of the MPhil and Inclusive Innovation Program. And he's also been integrally involved with work here at the Bertha Center. And Warren, there was a question that I saw by Percy Matlati, which I thought it would be wonderful if you could reflect on it with us, where he asks about how can these social or systems change approaches be embedded into our education system and I'd like to broaden that question a little bit to some of the conversations you and I have had about how important it is for university spaces to bring in the narratives and stories that we've been hearing from Renee and Rose and why that work is also important. Sorry after years of uh, um, working on Zoom I'm still forgetting the mute function like many of us. Um, I guess, uh, first of all, let me say, thanks, Kenzie, for the question. First of all, let me just say, I love this book. This is a good book. This is a great book. And it's filled with wisdom. And, and that wisdom is the wisdom of the thousands and thousands of people who have been working on these projects and, so, and, and organizations and movements in so many contexts. Um, and you really feel that coming through. Uh, I think it has so much to say to us. So the, the short answer, you know, can we get, do we need to get this kind of wisdom into our educational system is, uh, of course we do. We need to do it yesterday. We need to do it a hundred years ago. Um, I would say, you know, I work at it as many in the room, in the virtual room do at the university level, but, you know, I think these questions we should be studying and thinking about and working on in kindergarten and first in our in primary school, starting to think about ourselves as participants in the systems around us at, a, as, a, at as early an age as possible, and then to start um, experimenting and learning some of the principles and practices um, that Cynthia and Francois highlighted and many others um, that other people are also uh, trying to articulate in the world. So yes, for, for sure. Um, the other thing that I just will throw in there, and I think it responds to some of the questions, um, other questions popping up. For me, um, as I'm listening and hearing this book, and I love the, the emphasis on the depth and on coming back to, to context and to people, um, to thinking about not just the, the forms that we're working with, but the, pat the deep underlying patterns of value and belief. And I know the organizations that I know in the book and others like them work at those levels so profoundly. Um, but I think that what I'm hearing is a challenge in the book um, to all of us to, to think really hard about where do those patterns, where do those values, where do those systems actually live? You know, where do we actually meet them? And we get a sense of it when we talk about people and grassroots and this mysterious we um, that you talk about so well in the book, but how do we get to that we? And I, I know our labs have been one of my great teachers of, about that. Um, I, I remember actually you start, I think chapter four um, with Brent, Brent's story from our labs. And I remember talking to Brent at our labs um, once and saying, you know, what's the secret? That's all I ask everybody, all the what's the secret? And Brent said, the secret is that it's, you learn it's not about you. It's about what you can do for other people. It's, you know, it's, it, it's freeing, it's liberating to realize that. And I said, yeah, I guess that's true, Brent, but at the same time, don't you feel like it's all about you? Like when you walk into our labs, they want to hear your story. Renee said the organization started by, we want to change one person's life. So in some ways, as soon as you walk into our labs, whoever you are, you're like the most important person that ever lived in, in, in that encounter. And he said, oh yeah, that's true too. So somehow, you know, it's, it's not about me at all. And it's all about me when I come into these spaces. And that made me realize that kind of at the core of everything that you are talking about in this book is it's, it's not the person, it's not the community, it's not the relationship, it's not the system, it's the encounter. It's the moment of two people or more people coming together 
Um, not the long structure of that, but literally that moment. And if I had to say, what's the atom of the social world? You know, what's the thing that we could split and release all of the energy that, that you could see in these book, uh, in these cases have been released. It, it's, it's not even the person. It's literally that moment that we all have every day when we're, when we're start just facing someone. That might be someone in the community, that might be a government official, you know, as we're trying to work at the at, at high scale. There's still always this very micro immediate moment at whatever scale you're working at that is only in the now. And that for, to me is the moment where the kinds of compassion and wisdom and curiosity and humility and experimentation that you talk about so beautifully in the book, that's the only place it can live. So if I hear this challenge, when we th think about across all these scales, as we have to do, and as you pointed out, how do we also bring all of those skills right into that immediacy of our encounters with each other in the day-to-day, -day, in the moment, in the conversations and the meetings? Um, and I think you give us beautiful glimpses of that. And that's what I'm taking away right now as I think about uh, my own engagement with system work. Thanks so much, Warren. There's so many good questions that are coming through, and unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all of them. But Cynthia, here's one that came through that I thought was really interesting, um, and it's from Karen, and she asked, policy at national level relies on big groupthink machinery. Um, Cynthia is proposing participatory approaches that require nuanced interventions of continuous flexible engagement that continually inform policy. I'm keen to hear the group's input on how we do this. Briefly. Cynthia. Oh, it's such a big question. Such a big one. Um, yes, we talk about participatory policies and the, the case study that we really looked closely at for this was an organization called Nidan, uh, based in Bihar in India. And really in their work, they had done really big organizing work, bringing together uh, hundreds of thousands of activists from across the country to promote um, better working conditions for street vendors and informal workers more generally. And they ended up having a, a wonderful act um, the Street Vendors Act that got um, uh, promulgated in, in, in the Indian uh, Congress. Um, but what they realized after that was that their real work had only just begun. Um, the real work was actually ensuring that these new municipal committees uh, for town vendors were actually a place where those street vendors could be heard. So the true voice of the town vendors sitting in those committees, ensuring that policies were moved forward at the municipal level, enacted, implemented, so that the actual day-to-day -day lives of street vendors became better um, and that they were better able to secure their livelihoods. So for us, that was a case study in something that was a huge success at a political level, but actually they are still very much in the process of ensuring that that policy really lives out in the day-to-day -day, um, activities of, of their constituents. Um, and so all of the work that they did, we kind of unpack in the book and we look at that. We look at similar things across other case studies as well, um, but just knowing that it's not just policies, it's the patterns of behavior that policies drive and the iteration between those two things. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, Francois, I, there's a question here that links to all those questions well, and, and I think it's a critical one around, we need to empower collectives, preferably grassroots collectives. Still, there's the formal world of power and governance. How do we align these two worlds that are parallel? Where do they meet? Again, another big question. <laughs> you know, we're just touching the surface in, in a few minutes here. Um, I, I think as I wrote in, in the chat, there are so many um, examples of that, uh, the, the, the empowerment of collectives to engage those kind of top down uh, spaces of power. I mean, I'm in one of those spaces right now. So it's a really interesting kind of juxtaposition and, and feeling that tension. But I think the more we went into that, we recognized that, you know, I'm currently sitting in a position where the actors of power are redesigning systems, talking about systems change, right? And we're not going to have, we're going to have a different system, but it's not, the, the, the people who benefit from that system is not going to change. And so I think over and over again, we found that the building of the collectives, it's about power, right? The building of collectives helps to build power. Uh, and so, it, you know, there, what we look at, and this is, kind of, I guess, important to share in the book, is that this system change conversation is really abstract. And what we showed and what we hope to show in, in, in the book through, you know, 200 years of research, hundreds of interviews, eight deep case studies are the actual strategies, practices, and tactics that organizations use to do this work. And it is not spoken about. They don't speak about it when they speak to, you know, supporters or when they describe their work. They don't necessarily always recognize that people in their own organization are doing this work. It's not necessarily measured. And it's highly relational, as we spoke about. Uh, and, and so I think our purpose is to surface that 
uh, to recognize that, to make sure that's what we focus on. Dr. Precious Motsepe spoke about the process over, you know, the outcome and how important that is to lead to the engagement of those kind of actors of power that I think, you know, people recognize there's a disconnect and that's the system that needs to change, but it needs to be informed by um, uh, different kinds of groups and collectives who are currently not able to participate in any, you know, significant way in economic, political uh, and, and, and development systems. Cynthia, Francois, I mean, there's still so many questions and, I, and I'm so excited that people are ignited by what you've presented and shared with us as well as with Rose and Renee as well. But I'd like to hand over back to you guys just to maybe give a vote of thanks and close us out for the afternoon. Thanks, I'm gonna do a thank you. Cynthia, is there anything you'd like to say before I do? No, just a huge thank you for this large learning community. Just looking at the names of people coming through, we've learned so much from you over these many years. Um, it's It's been a, a, a true collaboration and uh, to just see so many thought partners that are here today supporting this is, is really, really wonderful. Thank you very much. And, and from my side, some very special thanks, uh, first of all, to the Bertha Center and UCT for, you know, that privilege of that journey. Uh, it was you know, I feel like I'm coming home today. Um, University of Cape Town and Graduate School of Business were amazing in creating the space for the center, the Bertha Foundation, in being a thought partner and a radical thought partner in pushing us. Um, the Motsepe Foundation uh, that really supported uh, this work. And, and thank you, Dr. Precious, for coming today. Um, of course, this whole community of actors that Cynthia spoke about, uh, especially uh, uh, Renee Marlon Parker here today and Rose Molokwane and uh, Sheila Patel we're thinking of as well from, from SDI and all the organizations we learned from along the way, the Birth of Scholars, everyone. It's really just unique and special for us to, to be able to try and share a little bit of what we've uh, gathered over five years of work uh, with you today. Uh, we want to also say that um, uh, there will be a giveaway of the book, so uh, we are collecting the, the best questions that came through fodder for lots of more discussion. Uh, we will also, for, for, for the additional books we have to give away, uh, sponsored by the Motsepe Foundation, uh, we will uh, do on a random basis, or you can send an email to the Bertha Centre, if someone can drop the Bertha Centre email address in the chat on a first come first serve basis, we'll make sure if you can't get one, we'll get you one. Otherwise, it's down at a rock bottom price for 25 Rand on ebook or on Kindle uh, and the hardcover versions as well and uh, available. So we want to make it sure it's as accessible as possible. If you need, would like to read it, we'll make sure that we get a copy to you. Uh, from that side, uh, a very big thank you to everyone and to hand over uh, to Solange, director of the center to talk about the future. And thank you so much for having us. Thanks Francois and thanks Cynthia for an amazing overview and intro to your book. And that's whet everybody's appetites who have not yet read the book. Thank you to Precious Motsepe who, uh, who willingly came onto this um, launch, uh, who's a very busy person. And so we appreciate your support and the Matepe Foundation support. Thank you to Renee and Rose and Warren. And I also would like to thank the Bertha Center team behind the scenes, Grant and Precious, who are so amazing, and Kense, who's also part of the Bertha Center team. So, um, a big uh, clap to them as well for all of the work they've put in uh, to organize this launch. I wanted to just um, end off on um, a note about the birth center going forward. So we continue to do this work. The fact that, that Francois and Cynthia are in different countries around the world and in the global north doesn't mean that they don't continue to work with us and to support us in the work that we do. Our vision as the Bertha Centre is to create a more just society and inclusive sustainable economy driven by social innovation and entrepreneurship towards systems change. We do this through teaching, researching, convening, events like this, catalyzing and advocating for social justice more, most importantly. We focus on education and health and youth and innovative finance, and we want to have a much more um, emphasis on climate justice. I think at this moment in time, climate justice alongside social justice is 
is the the biggest challenges of our time. And so that is also an issue that is completely um, embedded in the system that we need to, to collectively help to change and, um, and to create what somebody in the chat said, a different economic um, and environmental order. So I thank you all. I don't want to go over time. Um, I really, really have enjoyed this. And congratulations to Cynthia and Francois um, and a heartfelt yeah, thank you to all of the participants who have uh, joined us today. So thank you from all of us over and out.